This class uh, gave, uh, gave uh, the topic of the curse of economic nationalism. And I actually taught uh, an, an online uh, Mises Academy course uh, a couple of years ago on, on this uh, topic since I've, I've written a good bit about it. But uh, so, so some of you who have read some of my writings know that one of the things I try to do is uh, I study economic history and then draw lessons for today from, from history. You know, it's not... It's not unique with me, of course, you know, <laughs> the old saying, those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat uh, its failures, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, probably thousands of years old, that, that, that idea. And so that's, that's what I'm doing here. And, uh, and, and this is particularly relevant, you know, I think, because uh, the topic, economic nationalism, well, what the heck is it, first of all? But uh, this is an article from uh, the Breitbart uh, website, which is the, uh, the 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 main pro-Trump website, I think, in the world, probably. And uh, you know, it's uh, you know his his right-hand man, Steve Bannon, was the the uh, ran it until he uh, joined the government. And this is an article, but there's a, a guy who writes for them in uh, by a, a pseudonym named Virgil. I guess he thinks pretty highly of himself. He, he's, uh, he, you know, he, that's his picture there on the lower left-hand side. <laughs> and, uh, and this one says, uh, this is about a speech that uh, President Trump made in Kentucky a couple of months ago. I think it was in, in March. And it said, uh, Trump connects to the taproot of American economic and nationalism with Henry Clay's American system. Henry Clay was from uh, Kentucky. Uh, he's, uh, he, uh, he ran a slave plantation that grew hemp in Kentucky. He was known as the Prince of Hemp in his time. And he once said that, you know, and he, you know, he became the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Senator, Secretary of War, uh, and, you know, quite the big shot in American politics in the 19th century. And, uh, and he once said that the reason he got into politics was that he wanted uh, to impose protectionist tariffs on foreign hemp, and he wanted to get the taxpayers to pay for roads and canals so he could ship his hemp to the markets in the, in the East. And so um, he, was a, he was an honest politician, um, and, that's, and that's that was. Uh, and so uh, you know, and I'm working on a, on a book on him. You know, Gary North has been uh, bugged me for years because I wrote a book on Hamilton, and then L Abe Lincoln is, uh, is sort of the political son of Hamilton, and but in the middle there is Henry Clay. He was sort of the uh, the, the connecting link uh, uh, ideologically between between the two of them, and so. And so here's President Trump saying that this, you know, his agenda is economic nationalism. And they're writing about it in Breitbart. I sent a book proposal to a Regnery not too long ago to write a book about this. And uh, they turned me down. They said it wouldn't have the popular appeal of my last book, but it's the whole Trump agenda. So they, they, they apparently thought the whole Trump agenda uh, would not have any appeal to the public, to the public for this. So, so, uh, so I'm going to publish it elsewhere anyway. But uh, this article, you know, what it says about this, I'll read a few things about it. The 45th president, Trump, uh, name-checked Clay no less than seven times in his speech and used the phrase American system three times. So he, his speech writers, probably Bannon, knew all about this, this stuff. Uh, Trumpism, says, is in fact an agenda deeply informed by the best traditions of American history. It was the American system that built up this country, giving us widespread prosperity and also, crucially, the material muscle we needed to win the wars we had to fight. I don't know, when, when's the last time we won a war anyway? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, you know, what wars are they talking, the Civil War? I don't know. Uh, the factories envisioned by Clay were truly the arsenals of democracy. I don't, I don't think he ever envisioned factories, but... Uh, and then he says, the, uh, it's fair to say that the American system was the dominant economic school of thought in the U.S. until the 1970s. Then over the next few decades, it was disastrously pulled down. And today we see the consequences all around us. And that's all false, by the way. And, and, uh, and I'll explain why. And so this, this American system, you know, what is it? I mentioned it uh, briefly in, in my other talk uh, yesterday. Uh, it's the the phrase was actually coined by Alexander Hamilton, and uh, and and I described it yesterday in my talk. I'll repeat this quote again from Murray Rothbard because he really nailed it uh, when when he when he studied early America, and he first ran across this American system language uh, by reading Hamilton, 
And he, here's here's what Murray Rothbard said in his book, The Mystery of Banking, uh, Hamilton and his his uh, political compatriots were up to. They wanted, quote, quoting Murray Rothbard, to reimpose in the new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. A strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. And this was called mercantilism at the time. Uh, and the, you know, a, a rough definition of mercantilism is uh, a set of policies that benefits producers at the expense of consumers. Protectionism would be a, a perfect example. Mercantilism. Okay. And uh, you know, if you ever studied the history of economic thought, as I did, I had three courses in it in graduate school, and uh, you know, mercantilism was uh, uh, you know it, it's something uh, one of the more more foolish ideas in the whole history of economic thought, but it's a synonym for the American system. And so when you see articles like this, you know, like in the Breitbart claiming that uh, the Trump economic policy will bring us back to the glory days of mercantilism, it's, it's like like 18th century uh, corruption is what we want. And so, so Hamilton's, so that was Hamilton's American system it was protectionist tariffs, uh, what, to what we today call corporate welfare to, for road building, canal building. Eventually it became railroad building in the U.S. Uh, and uh, and a national bank, a national bank to uh, to provide cheap credit for politically connected businesses and to inflate the economy, and also a big public debt. That was that was a part of Hamilton's original American system, a large public debt. Okay, and to to persuade people of this, you know, the, the mercantilism, the the people who defended mercantilism in England and other parts of Europe. They, they had to hire publicists for this. They, they had to bamboozle the public into thinking that special interest policies that rip off the public for the benefit of a small group were really in the best interest of the public. So they had to, they had to pull, the, pull the wool over the people's eyes, and, and they did that in various ways. And, and, and in America, one of the masters of that was Hamilton himself. And, and, and one of the techniques he used... Uh, was, which was not original with him, is to s describe all these policies as in the public interest. And he used the public interest in many ways. There's a, a, a political scientist named Cecilia Kenyon who wrote a, uh, an article once in the American Political Science Review called uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Conservative Rousseau, I think. It was about Hamilton, uh, the Conservative R Rousseau, or the Rousseau of the Right. That's what it was, Rousseau of the Right. And in it, she put together a big, long list of the various uh, uh, synonyms that uh, Hamilton used in his writings for the public interest. And in various writings where he tried to convince people that, say, protectionist tariffs or uh, the granting of a monopoly to a, to a particular politically connected business were really in the public interest uh, you know, to, to do that. And I'll, I'll read you some of the language he used in his actual writings. The public good, the public interest, the public wheel public safety, the public welfare, the public felicity, the public happiness, the general good, the general interest, the common interest, the national interest, the national happiness, the welfare of the community, the true interest of the community, the permanent welfare of society, the good of the whole community, common interest of humanity. And so, so if you, if you get ripped off by paying two or three times the price for uh, the next uh, pair of shoes you have to buy, that's for the good of humanity, according to, uh, to the mercantilists. And, uh, you know, if you repeat language like that enough, a lot of people will believe it. And uh, so that's one of the oldest tricks in the book. Uh, and it, come, it comes from uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the, the French philosopher. That's really, uh, he, he argued that there is such a thing as the public w will, and, but only a small elite knows what this will is, and, the, and they, they therefore have the right to oppose that will on everybody. And, and so, so in, in many ways, the Hamilton and his cronies were, they were the real uh, Jacobins in American politics, not the, not the Jeffersonians. And so, 
So the uh, the Bank of the United States story, uh, uh, that, that was the linchpin of economic nationalism as a national bank to fund to fund this. And we did get a national bank. Uh, Hamilton succeeded, and that was the first plank of the, of the American system. And here's what uh, Rothbard said about it, the Bank of the United States in, the, in his book, History of Money and Banking in the United States. As soon as it was created, uh, 1791, the Bank of the United States promptly fulfilled its inflationary potential by issuing millions of dollars in paper money and demand deposits, pyramiding on top of $2 million in specie, that is gold and silver. The bank invested heavily in loans to the United States government, in addition to $2 million invested in the assumption of pre-existing long-term debt assumed by the new federal government. The bank engaged in massive temporary lending to the government, which reached $6.2 million by 1796. The result of the outpouring of credit and paper money by the new bank of the United States was an increase in prices of 72% in five years. So it created uh, pretty much massive inflation, price inflation uh, immediately as, as soon as we created it. And as I said in my talk yesterday, the, the, the first bank in the United States had a 20-year charter and it created so much inflation and economic stability and corruption that it was not renewed after 20 years. But then the War of 1812 came and they renewed it again. And uh, in 18, January of 1817, it went back into business and it promptly created the Panic of 1819. Uh, which, uh, which, of course, uh, Rothbard has written about pretty uh, pretty extensively. It was his doctoral dissertation on uh, the Panic of 18, 1819. And then the bank, uh, you know, so it was quite the calamity. I mean, and keep in mind, these are the things that, uh, you know, the, the advocates of uh, uh, economic nationalism are saying, you know, this is what we need. We need to, we need to have this, this today. We need to bring this back today. And so... So the bank was resurrected, and it was it was killed again by Andrew Jackson in in the in the late 1820s, early 30s, and I mentioned yesterday some of the statements Jackson made in, in vetoing the bank, and I, I didn't tell you all of them, but here's here's one description that Andrew Jackson said about the, the this bank of the United States. He called it a monster, a hydra-headed monster equipped with horns, hoofs and a tale so dangerous that it impaired the morals of our people, corrupted our statesmen, and threatened our liberty. It brought up members of Congress, bought up members of Congress by the dozen, subverted the electoral process, and sought to destroy our Republican institutions. That's a pretty good reason for vetoing the rechartering of the bank, uh, I would think. And so you don't hear politicians talk like that anymore, unfortunately, about, about the Fed. You know, as a, so this is a precursor of the Fed that he's he's condemning with this kind of language, and then uh, you know John Marshall was a protege of Hamilton's, uh, and he, he he worshipped Hamilton. A lot of John Marshall's uh, uh, legal opinions were literally verbatim of some of Hamilton's uh, uh, writings, uh, literally word for word in, in some of them. And when when uh, John Marshall. Uh, uh, issued the opinion, his opinion, personal opinion, that the Bank of the United States was constitutional. Uh, well, back in those days uh, in America, uh, uh, not everyone thought of the Supreme Court as uh, uh, black robe deities, as the, you know, the voices of God, and they didn't always pay attention to it. They pretty much said, okay, thanks for your opinion, now get lost sometimes. And here's, what, here's Jackson's version of that. Uh, he's, he says, to this conclusion, that, that is the conclusion that the Bank of the United States is constitutional, I cannot assent. Congress and a president, as well as the court, must each for itself be guided by its own opinion of the Constitution. So he's saying, we have three branches of government, not one, uh, let alone just you, Mr. Marshall. You know, who are you? It is as much the duty of the House of Representatives, of the Senate, of the president to decide upon the constitutionality of any bill or resolution which may be presented. The opinion of the judges has no more authority over Congress than the opinion of Congress has over the judges. And on that point, the president is independent of both. The authority of the Supreme Court must not therefore be permitted to control the Congress or the executive, but to have only such influence as a force of their reasoning may deserve. And so back in those days, it was assumed by a lot of people that, yeah, we have three branches of government in the United States, and uh, five government lawyers with lifetime tenure should not be responsible for defining everybody's liberties in the, in the country. 
In fact, the old Jeffersonians warned that if that day ever come, we'd all live under a tyranny. And of course, we live, we've, we've had that system in this country for at least 150 years now, uh, as far as that goes. And so, so we, uh, they did destroy the bank, and it went out of business. And we didn't have a, another central bank until uh, 1913. But we had something uh, also insidious uh, in the 1860s, the National Currency Acts, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, the second plank of, uh, of Hamilton's American system was crony capitalism, what today we call crony capitalism. There's, there's a great free book downstairs on crony capitalism that you should, that you should pick up. It's a, it's a very interesting topic. And, uh, and, uh, and Hamilton wrote this, this famous uh, series of uh, reports to the government, very long-winded reports. One was called The Report on Manufacturers, where he made the case for what, what we today call crony capitalism. Uh, in those days, they called it internal improvement subsidies, a, a, a euphemism for crony, for mercantilism, basically. And here's where he made the famous infant industries argument that he said this, you know, some new industries, they're infants, and they need support by the government. They, they, can't, they can't compete against the British or the French or the Spaniards who have already developed industries and in various things and, uh, for a long time, for in some cases for decades. So they need help. They need to be subsidized. And, of course, the, the standard response by most economists is that uh, the history of this is that the infants never grow up. You know, once, once you put them on uh, the dole, uh, they're always on the dole. Uh, the steel industry, for example, has been uh, subsidized with protectionist tariffs uh, of, or, and other forms of protection from competition from the very beginning, from the early early 19th century, from uh, its, invent, its inception. And, uh, and you know, you fast forward a couple hundred years, or 150 years anyway, and one of the first things uh, the Bush administration did was to put 35% tariffs on steel. And so it's, it's still an infant industry, 35% tariffs. This was the George W. Bush administration. And so, yeah, some infant industries never do grow up. And, and of course, when, while Hamilton was saying that, there were American industries, uh, such, especially shipping, that were growing like crazy and doing very well without any subsidies whatsoever and were overtaking some of the some of the European industries in terms of competition, in terms of global competition. And so they were proving him wrong as he wrote this uh, this thing. But this has been, uh, you know, a, a case that has been made yeah, to this day. You still hear uh, examples of this as far as that goes. Uh, he made the case for free, the free rider problem. He articulated free rider problem for, to justify government subsidies to build roads and canals, and that was later used to build uh, for, for railroads. And, and again, at the same time, uh, you know, private corporations were building thousands of miles of private roads in America in the first uh, decade or two of the 19th century. And wh you know, while he was making this argument, this was all going on, and he had to, he had to know that, uh, I think, anyway. And it was Hamilton. Also, a part of this was the idea that the government should should choose which industries to uh, to subsidize and which not to subsidize. Picking winners and losers, you know, in the language of uh, gambling, I guess, is what you would call here. And the basic problem that always exists with this is there's a public choice problem, and then there's a knowledge problem. To use the language of Hayek, the knowledge problem, uh, because of course, uh, you know, how how can politicians who have no financial stake in a particular, the growth of a particular industry uh, uh, be relied upon to pick which industries uh, should be subsidized and which should not. Uh, it's one thing for investors to put their money behind what they think is a promising new industry because if they, if they guess wrong, they personally lose uh, their money. If they're right, they make a profit. So you've got the incentives in the right place anyway. It doesn't guarantee they're always going to be right but that's the right incentive. Whereas with government, when you have politicians doing this, if they're wrong, it's no sweat off their back. There's no penalty at all for being wrong because it's not your money. Uh, and if you're right, uh, well, you, know, you, don't, you don't really win out and accept, you don't get anything, any exceptional income yourself anyway if you're, if you're right. You just, you just get campaign contributions from the, the subsidized businesses or industries, and that's about it. And so... Uh, so that's and and that's one one problem with that. And then the public choice problem is, of course, is that if you put politicians in charge of subsidizing what they think are the industries of the future, uh, the industries what will determine how they spend the money 
is is politics. It's the, where they how it will earn them the most votes and campaign contributions, and that's not necessarily the same as the industries that will serve the consumer the best, uh, as far as that goes. And uh, when I talk about this with students, I ask them if if the, if the U.S. government were to start massively subsidizing the computer industry back in the 1970s at the at the beginning of the computer revolution, you know the, the personal com personal computer revolution anyway, and it had some options of who to subsidize. Uh, IBM, you could, so you could give money to IBM. That would be a safe safe place to put money. Uh, uh, choice number two would be the computer company that exists in the dis congressional district of the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. That's another company. Or a bunch of bearded, long-haired 20-somethings tinkering with computers in Bill Gates' father's garage in California. You know, who do you think the U.S. Congress would give the subsidies to? Okay, these are the people who founded Microsoft uh, in, in Bill Gates' father's garage. And that money would go to IBM and, and the, you know, the, the company in the, uh, owned by the, uh, that's in cahoots with the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. And, uh, and if you want to see something funny, by the way, uh, Google uh, picture of Microsoft founders. And you'll see a picture of Bill Gates. It looks like, it looks like the cast of uh, the movie Revenge of the Nerds. And, uh, you know, and Bill Gates looks like he's about five years old in, in, in the picture. But uh, I use that in a classroom uh, to talk about how, how competition is, is, is always pervasive and ongoing. And even mighty IBM was toppled by these guys. And you look at them, it looks like a bunch of kids you know, in, in the 1970s. And it's, it's a funny looking picture. You know, I think it is anyway. You know, it's, it's, uh, Although some of the, although all of our faculty here probably look just like that at the same time around that time, and so so that's a problem with that's always been a problem with with that, and if you read the, this um, the report on manufacturers, uh, one of the interesting aspects about this is that uh, the historians typically say that it was Jefferson who was sort of the economic ignoramus, uh, Hamilton's uh, nemesis. Uh, but, you know, he he was in favor of agriculture. He wanted America to be a bunch of farmers. And what does he know about industry? But that's unequivocally untrue. It was Jefferson, who was very uh, widely educated in economics. You know, one of the one of the names up here. I don't know if it's in this room or downstairs. Is uh, Turgot, the the French uh, the or is, yeah, it's right there, it's right in front of me. Uh, uh, Turgot is right there. He's a you know he was a, a French physiocrats. You know, a free market precursors to the Austrian school. And he was the leader of that. He was also the French finance minister. And he was a personal friend of uh, Thomas Jefferson's. If, if you were to walk into Monticello this afternoon, it's uh, Jefferson's home in Virginia. Uh, you walk in and right here above your head is the big uh, marble bust of Turgot. He's right there. That was that Jefferson himself put there. And he translated into English his writings, his free market economics writings. Hamilton, on the other hand, all he, he knew nothing uh, about uh, his, his biographer, Ron Chernow, writes that uh, when he got the job as Treasury Secretary, George Washington told him, I didn't know you knew anything about finance. We never talked about finance. And, and so he read a dictionary. He read a dictionary of economics that uh, Senator Timothy Pickering had given him to sort of learn some of the lingo of economics. And then he wrote a big, long letter to the richest man in America, Robert Morris, who got him, uh, who hired him as his sort of political plant in the administration of George Washington to help get the Bank of the United States started and, and things like that. But it was him, he, it was Hamilton who was the ignoramus on economics. And if you read his report on manufacturers, if you read The Wealth of Nations or understood the ideas in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations published in 1776, uh, there, there's no evidence of it uh, in there in there at all because he, he sort of thought he had this idea that uh, economic development could not take place unless it was guided by a very visible hand, uh, such as his, his, his hand. And, and, uh, and so he didn't uh, buy into that at all. That's how he can make all these, uh, these arguments, the infant industry arguments and, and so forth. And on trade, he was especially bad on trade. He was also a big, uh, that was a third plank of the American system, protectionism, tariffs. And some of the arguments that he makes in this, this uh, report were, that he, he said that trade barriers, such as high tariffs, will actually cause lower prices to consumers. 
So we should, we should block off all imports. And he said, because if we do that, then the internal competition will become more intense. The, you know, the American businesses competing with each other become more intense and prices will fall. Well, that's contrary to all world history, uh, for, for one thing. And it's not logical, you know, if, if the competitive pressure is lessened, there's, you're going to have less price cutting and not more. He also made the argument that transportation costs are a waste. Therefore, we should prohibit anything that has to be shipped from England or France or anywhere like that. If we can make it here, we should only allow imports of things which we cannot grow or make here, like coffee. If we can't grow coffee in America, then we can import coffee. But, uh, but otherwise, nothing, because transportation costs are a waste. And that sort of contradicts uh, the idea that the founders put into place when they advocated the, uh, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, where they gave the federal government the right to, uh, to uh, regulate uh, interstate commerce, uh, because the, you know, the history books tell you that uh, one of the things they talked about was they wanted to encourage free trade between the states. But of course, that involves transportation costs. If you, if you ship something from Alabama to Georgia, it, you know, so should we ban that? Should we ban it? It's, it's totally a flat contradiction. And, uh, and, so, and, and so another thing he said, he just ignored the, the effect on consumers. This was a classic mercantilist uh, polemic the report on manufacturers, because it is almost 100% ignores the effects on consumers of the higher prices that would be caused by all of this. And he also advocated a banning, a legal banning of exports of goods that could be used in manufacturing by foreigners. So if the British are making uh, 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 a certain type of textiles in competition with American textile manufacturers or clothing manufacturers, we should not ship cotton to, uh, to England uh, if they can use the cotton to make textile goods and then ship them to the United States, uh, he said. And of course, what, what that would do is that just American businesses would just lose out to foreign businesses who would ship that, those things to England that they could use to make, uh, to make these products. It's sort of like the futility of, uh, of, uh, of sanctions uh, you know, that, that, that we sometimes impose, uh, or the Cuban embargo, the embargo on Cuba uh, of American traders, whether you know, dozens of other countries around the world are free to trade with Cuba. And so all that does is deprive American businesses and Cuban consumers with uh, things that they could have bought from American businesses. But, but they, they can buy the same things or get the same things from other countries. And so these, these are things, though, that, that these arguments for protection uh, have been repeated endlessly over the decades. Uh, Abraham Lincoln made all the exact same arguments for protection. He was, he, as I said, he was the political son of, of Hamilton who carried forth the mantle of the American system in, in his system, in his uh, administration. And he, he especially, uh, he repeated many times the argument about transportation costs. We shouldn't allow any imports in because of the transportation costs will add a cost to, uh, to, uh, to the good. And of course, uh, the, you know, that's not even necessarily true all the time because, because of competition. Um, you know, they, they, other, if, if, if somebody in, in another country can produce something 50% cheaper than Americans can, so what that there's a, a tiny transportation cost involved? They'll still sell it cheaper than, than the American company can over here. And so, so you, you go through this and uh, Henry Clay became the, uh, the, uh, the carrier of the, of the flame after Hamilton died. Uh, in, a, in a duel with uh, Aaron Burr. I got an applause yesterday when I said that, when Aaron Burr shot him dead in uh, some of those students. Uh, and, I, and I told the story of Gary North once told me that uh, he once started a, Hamil a Aaron Burr society and they made baseball caps and it said, not soon enough on the back of the cup. I think he had a little pistol on the side and a, not soon enough was their logo as, as far as that goes. And so, so he carried this mantle through. It had no success. Uh, you know, president after president, uh, vetoed internal improvement subsidies. Uh, the, the, the Bank of the United States was destroyed. Uh, and, uh, and, and America had pretty much free trade. By the eve of the American Civil War, the average tariff rate was 15%, one five in, in the late 1850s. And that's the closest to free trade uh, the United States ever was in the 19th century, right on the eve of the Civil War. And then the, the, when, the, when the Republicans came in, 
Uh, they, they immediately increased the, the average tariff rate from 15 to 45 percent, and, and it remained at uh, 45, 50 percent or even higher until the income tax was enacted in the year 1913. So the, the, the ascendancy of the Republican Party, uh, first with Lincoln and then with the whole the cast of criminals after after him, they, uh, they, they, the protectionism was the trade policy of the United States, very high tariff rates, okay? And, and so when Lincoln himself uh, uh, decided to run for, uh, for political office, uh, he made speeches proclaiming that Henry Clay was, uh, he called him the beau ideal of a statesman, and he once said that all of his ideas, Lincoln's, all of his ideas about politics came from Henry Clay. And, and here's what he said when he first ran for political office, is Abe Lincoln. He said, he said, I presume you all know who I am. I am humble Abraham Lincoln. You know, you know a politician is lying when he calls himself humble, no matter who, no matter who it is. <clears throat> You also know he's lying when he says this. I'm continuing with the quote. I have been solicited by many friends to become a candidate for the legislature. My politics are short and sweet like the old woman's dance. I am in favor of a national bank, in favor of the internal improvement system, and a high protective tariff, period. That's, that's what Abraham Lincoln said was his, why he was getting into politics. So he was, the Whig Party at the time was the party of the, the wealthy and the, and the politically connected of the north uh, of, uh, of New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, the, the railroad corporations, the banking industry. That was the Whig Party of the north. There were southern Whigs that were uh, somewhat different, but uh, those were the northern Whigs, and, and that's who uh, Abe Lincoln hooked, his, uh, you know, hooked in with, is, um, connected himself with these people. And uh, a few more uh, uh, aspect, uh, quotations here. Uh, as to, as to uh, what Henry Clay was all about, and, and Lincoln you know, uh, just slavishly praising Henry Clay and saying, I'm just like him, I, you know, I want to run for political office to carry forward the, the Henry Clay's uh, agenda, which was Hamilton's agenda. There's a, a book by um, Edgar Lee Masters, <clears throat> On uh, Lincoln, called Lincoln the Man. <clears throat> Lincoln the Man. Edgar Lee Masters was Clarence Darrow's law partner. Famous uh, the the monkey Scopes monkey trial monkey case in uh, in the in nineteenth early twentieth century, and uh, which H. L. Mencken reported on very hilariously. And he was a famous playwright also. But he wrote this about Clay in this book. He said, Henry Clay was the champion of that political system which doles favors to the strong in order to win and keep their adherence to the government. His system offered shelter to devious schemes and corrupt enterprises. He was the beloved son, figuratively speaking, of course, of Alexander Hamilton with his corrupt funding schemes, his superstitions concerning the advantage of a public debt and a people taxed to make profits for enterprises that cannot stand alone. His example and his doctrines led to the creation of a party that had no platform to announce because its principles were plunder and nothing else. So if, you're, if what you're about in politics is plunder, you better keep your platform to yourself. Don't, don't announce it if that's what you're about. And so, so that's what we're into when we get uh, the uh, Hamilton, Clay, Lincoln, American system uh, cemented into place finally during the American Civil War, and we had a, we had some trial runs of this in America in the 1830s and 1840s, where state governments started funding internal improvements, and this was the first big push in the direction of of actually achieving this American system, and it turned out to be such a debacle all over the United States that by the time you get to the American Civil War, 1861. Every state, <clears throat> except for Massachusetts, had amended its constitution to prohibit the use of tax dollars to go to any corporation for any reason, because they had, they had all had such horrible experiences with money going to corporations to build roads and things. And I'll give you one example. This is uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's personal secretaries in the White House, George Nicolay and John Hay. After his death, they wrote a book about uh, Lincoln. And, and in it, they describe what happened when <clears throat> Lincoln was the leader of the Whig Party and the Illinois legislature, and he got $11 million allocated <clears throat> to build roads and canals in Illinois. He, he thought they, they could turn Illinois into New York. 
He, he wanted it to be the Empire State of the Midwest. <clears throat> and here's what Nicolay and Hay said. The market was glutted with Illinois bonds, one banker and one broker after another, to whose bonds they had been recklessly confided in New York and London, failed or made away with the proceeds of the sales. The system had utterly failed. There was nothing to do but repeal it, stop work on the uh, visionary roads and endeavor to invent some means of paying the enormous debt. And they, they go on to write that not a single road or canal was completed. They spent all that money. Some of it was stolen. Uh, it was this one big uh, inefficient mess. What else would you expect by giving politicians a pile of money to spend? To, you know, they're not experts in road building. And, uh, and, and that's what happened in state after state. And so, uh, and so uh, it, it became a, quite the debacle. And Lincoln was personally responsible for this. This was uh, the 1830s. But they never gave up on this. Uh, uh, by the time, uh, when you get to 1840, uh, my favorite president in all of American history, and Lou Rockwell's, William Henry Harrison, was elected president. He's, he's our favorite because he died in one month in office, after one month in office. <laughs> he died of pneumonia. He only lasted, so he couldn't have done much damage. So he has to be the best, highly ranked, most highly ranked president. You know, all these rankings of presidents, I don't see how he couldn't be number one in all of them, you know, no, matter, no matter what. But he died, and then uh, a member of the Whig Party was vice president, John Tyler. And so, uh, and so Henry Clay thought he was in high cotton, as they say down south, that they're finally going to ram through protectionist tariffs, a national bank, and corporate welfare gone wild. It turns out John Tyler was a Jeffersonian, and he vetoed everything. And so they, they kicked him out of the Whig Party. They burned him in effigy in front of the White House, and, uh, and, uh, and, and they, didn't, they had no success. He vetoed everything, protectionist tariffs, corporate welfare, and so forth. And so that's, this is why, by the way, if you read the book Recarving Rushmore by Ivan Elans, it's a, a good a book that ranks American presidents on the basis of how faithful they were into enforcing the Constitution in a way that would limit government. That's his criterion. It's not who kills the most people and spends the most money. That's the history profession. That's their criterion. Uh, and guess who came out number one in the book, Recarving Rushmore? Not, it was not my favorite, William Henry Harrison, but John Tyler, who, no, who of course, hardly anyone has ever heard of. Uh, and, and, but he, was, he turned out to be number one. So that didn't go on. But, but once Lincoln came in, and, the, and the, uh, the main opposition was always from the South, Southerners, and, uh, and so once they seceded, well, then, uh, uh, you know, the, the cost, uh, if you will, of secession was the, to America. One of the costs was, uh, uh, well, the, the Republican Party now had a monopoly in, in the government, and they put all this through. The, the, the National Currency Acts and the Legal Tender Acts created, uh, 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 and nationalized the money supply. The protectionist tariff rate went to 45 or 50 percent and stayed that way for 60 years. And, uh, and they started massively subsidizing uh, the railroads. And, and that, of course, led to one of the most famous uh, 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 cases of political corruption, the Credit Mobilier scandal of the Grant administrations, uh, which is also in inevitable. If you ever want to learn anything about this, It was, called, it was the name of the company, Credit Mobilier Company. And uh, in, in my writings, you know, I, I write about, um, uh, there was a man named James J. Hill. Has anybody heard of James J. Hill? Yeah, you've heard of James J. Hill. You've read my book. Okay. Yeah, well, the government massively subsidized the railroads. This is an interesting story. There's a book called Lincoln and the Railroads. It's been, it was written in the early 20th century, but reprinted. I have a copy of it. And it talks about how in 1857, Abe Lincoln was uh, offered the job of general counsel of the New York Central Railroad because he was a famous, wealthy railroad lobbyist and attorney at the time. From, from you know, He represented all the Midwest Chicago uh, railroad companies. Uh, and he turned it down because he had just invested in land in uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa, of all places. A big bunch of land in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And when he became president, one of the first things he did, even though the war was on, uh, they, they, the Battle of First Manassas was being fought, he, uh, he, he uh, called Congress back not to discuss the Battle of First Manassas, which his army lost, but to, dis to get the Pacific Rail Railroad Bill going. 
to start subsidizing the building of a railroad to California from the American Midwest. That was the priority. After all, he was a railroad lawyer, he was a railroad uh, attorney and, uh, and a lobbyist. Uh, the railroad corporations got him elected along with the banking, the bankers and the manufacturers, the protectionists of the North. That's what politicians do. You get an office, you gotta pay back the people who put you there. That's why they, that's why you're there. And so, so, and in this law, he made sure that the president got the right to decide where they would start building the Transcontinental Railroad. Anybody want to guess where they started building the Transcontinental Railroad? The Eastern Terminus? Council Bluffs, Iowa. Just, <laughs> of course, it's, to this day it's called Lincoln's Hill, uh, that, that a part of Council Bluffs, uh, Iowa. So he must have been, that's why he turned down this big time job, the general counsel of the New York Central, uh, offered him by Erastus Corning, uh, was that uh, he was apparently made a killing there. If you, if you were to go to, uh, Springfield, Illinois, this afternoon, Abe Lincoln's home, and visit his home. It's a museum now. It's on a, a part of town that's called Old Aristocracy Row. And his house is the biggest house in Old Aristocracy Row, and where he lived before he became president. You know, he lived there. And so, uh, and so that's, you know, that's what, you know, some things never change, do they? It, you know, it, it's pretty much the same as today. If you look at the, you know, the, the Goldman Sachs guy who becomes Treasury Secretary, he lives in the biggest house in Manhattan and, or, or wherever, something like that. But but James J. Hill, uh, in the 1870s, built a transcontinental, the, the Great Northern, without a, a penny in government aid, and proved that uh, it was not necessary. He, investors. Uh, capitalized the whole thing. He paid, uh, he paid the Indians for rights of way across their land with livestock, money, or whatever they could trade for. Uh, he found the shortest route uh, across the country, whereas the government subsidized railroads uh, was all political. So here you have, uh, I'll draw you a, my quick map of the United States, or a Thanksgiving turkey, one or, one or the other. <laughs> Let's say they started here. Here's Council Bluffs over there. James J. Hill, you know, he's a capitalist and he has private investors in, in, uh, investing in this. He has to make money, he has to minimize his costs and, and maximize his traffic. So he found the, the shortest route through the Rocky Mountains to the West Coast, uh, just something like that. Um, like that. And he became the most profitable, uh, the most efficiently built and the most profitable railroad, the Great Northern. The government uh, Here's the government railroads. Theirs look more like this. <laughs> because, because of the politics of it, because every member of Congress, even the representatives from the territories who were not yet Congress, said, you'll get our support, but you have to run a line to our town or else no vote from me. And so they had to run all these lines all over the place and, uh, and, and go, go hundreds of miles for, for maybe one person to ride the train every six months because that's the cost of getting my vote. And then when they built it, uh, you, the, you read the book by Burton Folsom on uh, entrepreneurs versus the state. They did things like they, they, they built railroad tracks on the top of ice packs in the, Rock, in the Rockies in the early winter when it was still you know, not so cold that you couldn't work. And they built the tracks. Then springtime came and the, the ice melted and the tracks would just, uh, just collapse. But that was all good because they had a per mile subsidy from the government. So the more miles of track you build, the more profit you make. And so, you know, who cares if the tracks collapse in the spring? It's all, it's all good for me. But a real capitalist like James J. Hill would never think of doing anything like that. And so, and of course, this was a, a later version of the disasters at the state level that I described earlier. They did the same kind of thing. That's, that's the incentives that governments have when you put them in charge of building something. That's, uh, that's what bureaucracies do. Okay, and then finally, you know, we had the National Currency Acts, uh, and I want to read you a few things about the the importance of the National Currency Acts, which is the other the other plank of the American system. I want, I want to read you what what some of the advocates of these things uh, were saying. Here's what Senator John Sherman, who was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee in during the Lincoln years, said. He, he was the brother of General Sherman. Is it from Ohio? And when they passed the National Currency Act, he, he was praising it. He's saying this. He said, uh, the, the, our purpose, he says, is, quote, to nationalize as much as possible 
even the currency, so as to make men love their country before their states. All private interests, all local interests, all banking interests, the interests of individuals, everything, should be subordinate now to the interest of the government. And that's what Senator John Sherman, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, said was the, the purpose of, the national, of nationalizing the money supply uh, in America. A, a Democrat named, uh, who was an opponent of this named uh, Lazarus Powell took the opposite position. He's a Kentucky Democrat. And he says this, the result of this course of banking legislation is utterly to destroy all the rights of the states. It is asserting a power which, if carried out to its logical result, would enable the National Congress to destroy every institution of the states and cause all power to be consolidated and concentrated here in Washington. And so the Republicans would hear that and say, yeah, right on. That's exactly. That's that's what we want to. That's the whole purpose of, of all of this. And so, if you fast forward even further, in my book on Hamilton called Hamilton's Curse, one of the chapters is called the Hamilton Hamiltonian Revolution of 1913, when we got the Fed, the income tax, and the Seventeenth Amendment at the same time. Uh, the Seventeenth Amendment called for the direct election of senators. Uh, well, once, once the importance of the income tax and the Fed is that the central government now has unlimited money. If they have a conscription law, uh, when Abe Lincoln was president, they couldn't afford to run down the, the runaways, the people who went AWOL from the military. They just didn't have the money to hire all the police to go, go chase them down. But when you have an income tax and, a, and a, the ability to print money like a Fed, you can afford anything. You know, you, if some guy in Iraq leaves the army, you could, you could hunt him down. You get a hundred people to go hunt him down in Iraq, you know, let alone the mountains of Pennsylvania, which is where a lot of the, the Union Army soldiers hid out after they uh, 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 abandoned uh, the, the army. And so, and so that's what they're talking about. They understood that the, the central government would become, have monopolistic power and, and, and many or, orders of magnitude more power than it previously had if it could get its, its claws and all that money that a, a nationalizing the currency would do, even without a Fed, even without a central bank. Uh, they, they, they were they were very happy about this, and so so that's why I you know I started out talking about you know this this uh, article in Breitbart praising uh, the American system, and uh, if you read the whole article, this was in March of this year. Um, they claim that you know it, it's a bad thing that we abandoned this 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 thing, but uh, I think the opposite is true. Uh, when I when my book on Hamilton came out, uh, my um, Random House was my publisher, and they, they wrote a great press release. They, they have really talented people who work for a company like that. And it's very persuasive that that uh, Hamilton was sort of the evil genius who's responsible for the crash of 08. They, 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 because, you know, after all, the Fed, he was, he, uh, uh, Ben Bernanke himself once called him the founding father of central banking in America. And so they, they brought me on uh, the Morning Joe television show and sat me down next to Patrick J. Buchanan. And the first thing Buchanan says to me is, Pat is uh, Alexander Hamilton is my hero. And so I knew it was going to be a bad day uh, after that. So they pretty much shouted me down. And, uh, didn't, but I did sell books because they put my book on the TV screen. And so I sold some books. And there were four people kind of shouting at me. And I just sat there saying, what's the use? And, uh, but I had in my mind, I'm going to get the last word. And I did. Right before they went to the commercial, they, they kind of shut up and they said, okay, let's give them 10 seconds to, to respond to all this. And, and all, all I could think of saying was that at least, at least Aaron Burr had a good reason for shooting someone, unlike Dick Cheney. And, that, and, that's, and, that's, and, and that was the end. That's, that's the only thing. It's on YouTube, but you can look it up. It's kind of a farce. But, uh, but uh, that's all. I guess our time is up, and uh, that's it for now.